uh, work on bioinformatic end of, of, of things uh, with Russ Corbett detail. Uh, but before that, uh, Eric was a, a postdoc with Leif Anderson at Uppsala, uh, where he worked on Darwin's finches in collaboration with Peter and Rosemary Grant. Uh, and then uh, before that, he got his PhD at Tulane University, where he uh, worked with Jordan uh, Carubian and also Scott Edwards. Uh, so uh, a lot of interesting work. He's done field work in lots of different areas, and he's had a string of super interesting papers on everything from plasticity and eels uh, to fairy wrens uh, to Galapagos finches. And I first uh, heard uh, Eric speak at a meeting uh, this <laughs> earlier this year uh, the population evolutionary and quantitative genetics meeting at, at Asilomar, and it was it was just a spectacular talk. It was so interesting, and I immediately went up to him afterwards and said, "You got to come to the MVZ and, and and give us a talk on that." So I'm uh, thrilled that you agreed to drive up from Santa Cruz, and uh, I'll turn it over to you. And please join me in welcoming Eric. Well, thank you for that uh, very kind introduction. Uh, it really is a great pleasure to be here. I'm excited to get to share some of the work I've been doing with all of you. Uh, and yeah, I hope you'll find it interesting. I think we're good on Zoom, so I'll go ahead and get started. Uh, so I've titled this talk, it's kind of a mouthful, something like Complete Community Genome Sequencing uh, and looking at large effect loci involved in uh, ecological traits and then also their evolutionary history. And I'm gonna talk to you about kind of two main projects along these lines um, over the course of the seminar. And uh, like many of you, uh, my uh, introduction to biology and doing research really was derived from my fascination with biodiversity um, as a whole. And so I, I put up some photos of some of these projects that uh, Michael mentioned that I've worked on in the past um, that encapsulate some of the ways that I think about biodiversity. And I, you know, see a lot of talks start this way. I kind of think of them as your, you know, colorful, cute animal overload or biodiversity uh, overload slide. Um, but I think that it gives me an opportunity to think, to describe kind of the way I think about biodiversity. And that's um, uh, the individual traits that make up some of the different species we see here, ranging from um, the bright colors of uh, female fairy wrens that I worked on in my PhD, or the bright colors of male wagtails that are uh, subject to sexual selection, or maybe it's the huge population sizes of pairing uh, or the, the finch of the uh, Darwin's finches, which facilitates their access to different types of resources. And I think that when I think about what are the kind of questions we can ask about, about what are the things that promote biodiversity, what are the things that maintain biodiversity, and hopefully ultimately how do we protect biodiversity, I often think about these individual traits that make up different species and different populations um, that represent this. And so in my research, I've often taken um, a directed approach to, to try to understand the evolutionary history and processes that generate um, traits in wild populations. And so I, I think of kind of three core components about how I've approached this in my research and the kind of things that I think about when I uh, approach questions that I'm interested in pursuing. And so I think a good way to, uh, to, to, to look about traits, uh, to learn about traits in biodiversity is that you can study the evolutionary history of a population uh, or the evolutionary history of a trait. You can use current you can study the current function and behavior um, associated with the trait through observation and monitoring. And then you can ideally use some of this information about historical processes and observations you make in current time to inform what you think might happen to populations of the future. And this really kind of takes this trajectory from back in time to forward in time. And in my research, uh, there are several different tools that I've used to approach these kind of questions. Um, so I've used genomic tools uh, and comparative genomics and speciation genomics to study the evolutionary history of traits and populations. And then in terms of current function behavior, I've used observa observation and experimentation to understand the function of traits and what's happened to populations and current alleles, uh, how alleles move through time in current time, uh, and connecting that together using population genomics. And then using things like natural experiments that might represent changes in the environment into the future to understand what might happen in the future as well as generating data that we might be able to use um, to conserve biodiversity. And I see this as kind of the, the integration across these different types of tools and ideas that, uh, that I use to pursue these questions. So I'll generally be talking about um, two main projects that capture these main ideas. One of them is the evolutionary history uh, aspect, which I, well, where I'll be talking about the evolutionary history of functional um, genomic elements involved in variation of beak morphology in Galapagos finches. And then I'll talk about a related project also using the Galapagos finches, uh, where, we, where we use population genomics uh, of an entire community to track how allele frequency change um, through time reflects population dynamics. 
At the very end, we'll talk a little bit about um, what future research might look like in Galapagos finches. Mm -hmm. So each of these projects are gonna be primarily about this system. Now, in recent years, we've seen um, really a rapid advance in our ability to use genomics to study non-model systems. Um, and I think that this means that it's a really exciting time for researchers like me who are interested in studying wild animals uh, to be able to understand uh, uh, a lot more about evolutionary histories. And so there's been... John? The classic bamboo stuff. <laughs> Uh, and uh, so there's been a lot of research that's been interested in using genomics um, where you can uh, uh, take the genome of different closely related populations, can compare them and identify places in the genome that are different amongst them that might be associated with the traits that vary amongst these populations. And I've put a few examples um, that I particularly like, including one um, that I was involved in with the wagtails, where if you look uh, across the genome, there's only a few different places in the genome that are highly differentiated amongst populations that have these different phenotypes. And these two uh, low side contain um, genes that are likely involved in the plumage phenotype of these wagtails. Now, in another example I've shown over here, uh, the researchers identified a large uh, inversion in the genome that's associated with variation in plumage uh, in the plumage of red poles uh, that like that contains various genes that are likely involved in the paleness of the plumage. And so, these approaches have been really powerful for identifying parts of the genome that might be associated with morphology that we uh, associate with species uh, differences or population differences. But one of the things that's challenging about these uh, projects is that uh, you don't observe the processes that happened uh, that generated these, these associations that we see here because they generally are evolutionary processes that happened um, deep in evolutionary time. And so I'll go from here to introduce uh, the main system that I'll be talking about today, the finches of the Galapagos Islands. And so many of you are probably familiar with this group. This is really an iconic adaptive radiation. Uh, so an adaptive radiation uh, is one in which one population has become uh, many in a very short period of time. And one of the reasons I say that this is a iconic adaptive radiation is that it's thought that observation of the finches by Charles Darwin likely played a important role in his theory of evolution by natural selection. And researchers uh, since Darwin have returned to this system uh, in order to study the processes that have generated the really remarkable morphological diversity that you see across this radiation. And so most of this variation is phenotypic variation related to bill morphology and body size um, and body morphology. Now, uh, among those researchers who were interested in studying uh, the finches in the Galapagos includes Peter and Rosemary Grant. And, and they were interested in studying really the process that generated all this phenotypic diversity. And so they selected a small island in the Galapagos, Daphne Major, which has a relatively small population of finches on the island. Um, there's four species of finches on the island, and, and there's really only a few hundred individuals, anywhere from 200 to maybe 600 individuals on the island. And in addition, the island is small enough that you can catalog all the plant and insect diversity on the island and really study it as a microcosm. And so this provided opportunities to track uh, how populations of finches on the island, how they changed over time, how uh, populations came together, how populations diverged, and even as new species form, that really provides some of the foundational examples uh, for how we understand natural selection happening in real time. And so I'm going to use Daphne Major to uh, introduce you to the topic of the beak of the finch. And so on Daphne, there are four different species of, uh, of finches on the island. And what I'm showing here is a morphological PCA. So across the x-axis, the first principle component loads overall on beak size, and on the second principle axis, uh, we see separation that's associated with overall beak shape. And across the x-axis, there's three species of seed feeding finches, uh, and the largest species over here on the right, the large ground finch, has this big honking bill. And this big beak is uh, able to take advantage and crush the larger seeds that are on the island, whereas if you compare over here the small ground finch, these exploit the uh, much smaller seeds that are present on the island, whereas the medium ground finch is able to exploit seeds somewhere in the intermediate um, area between these two. Now on the y-axis, this variation in beak shape is, is primarily driven by the, um, the cactus finch population, which has this very pointed beak, which, is, uh, uh, which allows them to exploit the cactus buds and flowers of the Apuncha cacti on the island. And so the thing that I really want you to take away from this is that this morphological variation has a, is a, a, has a very tight link to the resources that these finches eat. So it's really a key ecological trait. Now, because of this association between morphology and the ecology, researchers for a long time have already been interested in using genomics to study the genetic basis of these traits. 
there's quite a lot of studies um, that have taken this approach I described earlier, where you compare the genomes of different species and you look for places in them that are different amongst them. And these have been uh, quite successful at identifying uh, a number of uh, candidate genes that are likely involved in morphological differences. Um, but you'll notice a few things from uh, the slides from previous studies. One of them that is if we look across this top plot, uh, the genome is highly fragmented and it's hard to study each of these individual elements in very much detail because it's hard to know which ones might be uh, together as single loci. And so it's part of that motivation that led me and my colleagues to generate a new reference genome for the Galapagos finches recently. And we did the sequencing all in the Galapagos. We did the DNA extraction in the Galapagos and the sequencing as well on one of these uh, min ions. And we ended up being able to produce a pretty high quality genome assembly from this. So what I'm showing here is the uh, syntony with zebra finch, which is very high, as you tend to see across songbirds. And the genome quality is also exceptionally high as well. So this is really a, a, a very high quality genome. And we wanted to try to use it to return to some of these questions of uh, species difference in relation to the morphological differences that we see. So we sequence a few more populations of small, medium, and large ground finches, and we return to this question of, of looking across the genome for where do we see variation uh, associated with these three different species. So what we did is that we coded the small ground finches zero, the medium ground finches one, and the large ground finches two, and we ran the GWAS uh, looking for loci across the genome that are associated with being one of these different species. Now, consistent with previous studies, if you look across the genome, there's not a whole lot of loci that come out at the very uh, top of this Manhattan plot, um, but there are uh, a number of different loci that clearly are strongly associated with being one of these different species. And if you, if you break it down into individual loci, there's about 28 uh, independent loci that are significantly associated with these different species, which is uh, quite reduced compared to those earlier fragmented studies where we see um, quite a number of different signals across the genome. So some of those have come together and we uh, and are able to characterize them much better with this updated reference genome. Now we can take a more uh, typical FST scan approach, which I'm showing along the bottom here, uh, which are all the pairwise FST scans amongst different species. And we recapitulate um, a pretty similar pattern as we do with this GWAS approach that we took. And if we look at each of these 28 individual loci, we found that, especially in the large ground finch population, we see strongly reduced nucleotide diversity at these loci compared to the genetic background, which is consistent with the possibility that there is a selective sweep in the large ground finches or perhaps an ancestor of the large ground finches or possibly some other demographic scenario. But we thought that this was pretty intriguing and we were, uh, wanted to look at these loci in a little bit more detail. And what I'm showing here is a, a haplotype plot for one of the uh, for locus number 24. And this is a bit small, the, the, uh, the theme here, but each in dark red, we see homozygous alternative calls. In yellow, it's homozygous reference, and light orange is heterozygous here. And what you can see is that in the large ground finch, which is in this part here, uh, and the other larger species tend to be fixed for one haplotype, whereas other populations tend to be fixed for an alternative haplotype. But what we notice is that the medium ground finch is particularly variable, so they segregate for this haplotype. We also see deeper in the phylogeny other populations that seem to carry this haplotype as well. And this made us wonder whether or not these haplotypes have been around in the radiation for a while, or if they're moving around through hybridization and, and, and introgression. So we tried to break this pattern down across all the 28 loci into a way in which we could visualize it. And that's uh, the result of that is what I'm showing here. And across the top, we have the size of the different loci. So each of these elements are quite uh, quite large. So the haplotypes range in, in the, in the uh, anywhere from about half a megabase up to about two megabase. So they're quite large regions of the genome. And in this heat map here, we took each of these 28 loci and we looked at allele frequency differences compared to the large ground finch. And uh, each of the squares that are blue, you know, they're more similar to the large ground finch. And you can see that these species that have the larger feet tend to also have, uh, you know, bluer uh, modules here, suggesting that they're more similar at these loci to the large ground finch, whereas a lot of other populations are red, meaning they carry this uh, alternative haplotype. And what you'll notice is that throughout the phylogeny, we see little pockets of blue popping up, mm -hmm. uh, which raises again this question of um, whether or not these have been around for a while, or if it's just hybridization moving them around, or in incomplete lineage sorting that's uh, retained them in the populations that we see. And one that I'll point out here that we'll talk about in a moment is that the species with the fourth largest beak size also seems to contain a lot of these uh, blue elements here, suggesting that they have quite a lot of haplotypes shared with the large ground finch. So the first thing that we did is ask, what is the age of these haplotypes? So we can estimate haplotype age by comparing sequence divergence amongst them. And we find that most of these loci with time and millions of years on the y-axis here 
Most of them are predate the speciation events of the species where we identified the loci. Now, they've been around, they probably originated within the radiation itself, uh, but some of them are uh, nearly as old as the radiation itself, which is about um, a million years ago. So again, these haplotypes, uh, they tend to be quite old, uh, and most of them seem to uh, predate the speciation events that we, uh, that we used to first identify these in the first place. Now, we wanted to uh, test this question of intergressive hybridization, and so we picked out a population on Hennevesa. Uh, and here, the cactus finches have a particularly deep beak. So this is that one that I pointed to with the large beak a few slides ago. And we looked for evidence that there might have been <coughs> intergression from the large brown finches on this island into this population here. Based on pedigree analysis, we expected that there might be hybridization ongoing recently. And indeed, we find using this fraction of intergression statistic at each of these loci, sort of akin to an Ababa type shared derived allele sharing uh, type of statistic, um, we see that most of the loci have evidence that they have uh, uh, that they're present in this deep beaked cactus finch population as a result of intergression from the large ground finch population um, that's on the base side. So together, I think this suggests that uh, uh, the haplotypes are old. They're likely being retained through the populations, but they are also able to uh, move across populations through intergression, as we see some evidence for here. Now, of course, we are also wondering if these elements might contain genes that are likely to be involved in morphology. Um, and unfortunately, in the finches, we don't, of course, have a ton of functional information. Uh, we don't exactly have an aviary of finches to draw from. Um, but we are able to return to things like mice that have very good uh, data sets relating to gene expression uh, associated with different morphology. And when we carry over our genes to these uh, databases, we find that our genes show significant enrichment uh, with various developmental processes associated with jaw morphology, bone and cartilage development, and in general processes associated with development. So it's very easy to uh, uh, infer how that might be the, the kind of loci you're looking for that are associated with peak development. Now we do have some RNA-seq data, and what we had was uh, essentially eggs that hadn't hatched. We were able to uh, generate RNA-seq data from the embryos and these eggs, and so well, we didn't have between species comparisons, but we did look for uh, gene expression variation between the beak and other parts of the body. And we found significant overrepresentation uh, of genes in these haplotypes that we identified that are associated with uh, stronger expression in the beak than the rest of the body, suggesting that they might have localized expression in the developing embryo, specifically in the beak regions. We were able to probe this a little bit farther, further for a few different specific candidate genes, where, uh, especially this one, ALX1, which is likely associated with um, beak shape variation. We find very localized expression in the tip of the developing beak, which is also part of the beak where we would expect, uh, expect to find this if it's associated with the overall length of the beak. So together, I think this suggests that these haplotypes likely do contain at least some functional elements that are associated with the beak morphology that we see across different species. And so as a takeaway from this, uh, uh, from this section, what I want you to take away from it is that a lot of the genetic variation that we see that's differentiated amongst different species of Galapagos finches are on these haplotypes that tend to be quite old. They've likely persisted in part from incomplete lineage sorting and being segregated amongst populations, but they're also passed amongst different populations through intergression. They also contain a number of interesting candidate genes uh, that we think are likely associated with this variation in beak morphology that we see across the group. And broadly speaking, I think that this, uh, this pattern of finding these ancestral haplotypes segregating in, uh, in the populations um, is something that's come up repeatedly in other adaptive radiations and maybe a common theme uh, for this type of rapid diversification that, uh, that happens during adaptive radiation. So now we'll take uh, uh, a slight change over to um, a more population focused approach. And we'll be talking about contemporary evolution and using population genomics of an entire community. And uh, for this section, we'll be returning to the island of Daphne Major and this amazing long-term data set that Peter and Rosemary Grant put together over their uh, course of their career. And I mentioned to you that some of their uh, observations on the island provide some really foundational examples for how we think about natural selection. And I'm, uh, I'm showing one of these uh, classical examples here. And so shortly after the grant started monitoring populations of finches on Daphne Major, uh, an El Nino event um, occurred in 1976 and 1977 that led to an extreme drought event. During this period, there was a drop in the availability of small seeds and individuals, uh, uh, individuals that could crack the larger seeds that were still present are those that survive better and there's high mortality of individuals with a small beak. What this led to was a shift in the population mean to having an overall larger beak. So this is this sort of classical example of natural selection 
happening in real time. Now, if we look across the full trajectory of this data set, um, we don't actually find uh, we we don't find a predictable direction of natural selection throughout this time period. And so we see this period in the 1970s where this extreme selection event led to an increase in beak size, but later we see this drop in beak size um, following second uh, event that happened in the 2000s. And the reason for this is fundamentally a different mechanism of these selection events happening. So in the 1970s, there's this resource-driven mortality right after there's a less availability of small seeds. And later in the study period, uh, there's actually an increase in the presence of a larger species on the island, the large ground finch, which outcompeted medium ground finches for the larger seeds, leading to individuals uh, uh, with larger beaks and medium ground finches experiencing high mortality. And so the takeaway from this is that uh, natural selection occurs during these extreme events, but not necessarily in a predictable uh, direction. And for this next part, I'll point out that uh, while I have this graph on the screen, um, the grants were able to start collecting blood samples from these data sets uh, in 1983, so encompassing the second selection event in this general trajectory and beak size going down. And so in this project, uh, what I really wanted to do is try to connect uh, these processes that we see from doing population sampling, so selected sampling across populations, to really doing a full population sequencing experiment by leveraging this amazing data set. And fundamentally, I think this provides an opportunity to link some of these things we've learned from speciation genomic studies uh, to population genomic processes within the entire community. So we're going to go after a few different central goals of this project. We'll talk about how does genomic ancestry in a population change over time? What are the functional loci involved in beak variation? Can we see this at the individual level? And what is the genetic architecture for traits in wild populations? Mm -hmm. And ultimately, hopefully, hopefully getting at this goal of what does it look, uh, what does allele frequency change over time look like in this population that's experienced these uh, recurrent selection events? And I'm just going to take a sip of water. All right. So, over this uh, 30 year period, starting in 1983, the grants collected about 4,000 blood samples. Uh, and so, I generated whole genome resequencing libraries for each of these samples and then generated genotype likelihoods for each of these samples and imputed genotypes based on a, a, a higher coverage reference panel that I had. And we use these for all the analyses going forward. I won't go into this in more detail, but I'm happy to talk about this approach if people are interested in it later. In this data set, we have about 200, two and a half thousand individuals that have beak morphology data available for them. So this would be individuals that uh, grew old enough for their beak to have fully developed and could be measured. This is about 2,000 medium ground finches, about 900 cactus finches, and a smaller number of the other two species that are present in intermittent and uh, usually smaller population sizes, as well as quite a few hybrids on the island. And so the first thing I'm going to share with you is a snapshot of what the genomic ancestry looks like for all the populations on Daphne. And so this dendrogram at the top, so the general, general relatedness amongst all the individuals on the island, you can see we recover in general three main clades. Uh, we have the cactus finches in green, large ground finches here in yellow, and the medium ground finches and small ground finches are in this cluster over here on the right. And we already know from previous work that small ground finches and medium ground finches are very closely related. They share a very recent common ancestor and have experienced a lot of recent gene flow. So that's not too surprising. Uh, and there's a couple of things that you can take away from this. So each bar in this ancestry plot is one individual and the proportion of ancestry it has from other species on the island. And you can see that it's a very dynamic picture, right? There's a lot of heterogeneity. There's clearly a lot of allele sharing amongst different populations. Even these orange chunks um, from the large ground finch and other populations is likely a signature of ancestral gene flow events. Um, but what's clear is that there's a lot of heterogeneity in here. Um, I put this up because this is the admixture proportion of cactus finch ancestry. And we look at the medium ground finches and the, and the cactus finches, we can see there's a very tight relationship between ancestry and the shape of the beak. Um, and in some ways, this gave me some confidence that we're doing something sensible with these genotypes. Um, right? We did low coverage sequencing, but it does capture biology as we might um, have predicted it to be. And if you're looking at this plot, you may have noticed this, this chunk of the large ground finch um, ancestry track. And this is a little bit surprising. And what we found is that individuals in these two, in two different ancestry groups differ more morphologically in the large ground finches. So one of them is quite a bit larger than the other one. And what we found by comparing to the reference panel is that these smaller large ground finches are derived from uh, Santa Cruz Island, which is just a short boat ride away, so it's the closest island, whereas the other group, we actually don't know what the island of origin is. Um, it seems to be one that we haven't sampled yet. There's a few, um, a few populations we're going after to figure that out. But the main thing I want you to, to take away from this 
is that there's really two different contributions to genetic diversity in the population of Daphne finches. There's hybridization, which leads to these varying dynamics of shared ancestry or variable ancestry, as well as a contribution from immigration of different populations to the island. Now, these changing ancestries um, also reflect changing morphological cha uh, changing morphology over time in this data set. So what I'm showing here across the top uh, is this trend in beak size that's gotten smaller. We looked at this earlier in the medium ground finch. And what you can see is that the self ancestry of medium ground finches has declined as much as 20% in this population, whereas the ancestry of the small ground finch has increased um, by almost 15%. Now we see a different trend in the cactus finches, whose beak shape has become progressively more blunt across the study period. And this corresponds to a drop in self ancestry, again, of almost 20%. We see an increase in the frequency of medium ground finch ancestry in the cactus finch population. And so it's interesting, these two populations, we know through pedigree analysis, are hybridizing quite a lot with each other. But we see differences in what the outcome of that is, right? So the medium ground finch ancestry has increased in cactus finches, but in the medium ground finch, uh, the cactus finch ancestry is studied well, relatively low. And this is because the recruitment of hybrid offspring um, from these hybridizations tend to go back into the cactus finch populations, whereas the main contribution in the medium ground finch population seems to be from the smaller uh, ground finches. And this is all in nice comparison to what is effectively a control over here in the large ground finch population, which has had relatively stable ancestries through time. And we knew from pedigree analyses that they're not hybridizing with other species on the island. So we see a very um, dramatic difference in how these genetic backgrounds have, have been changing over time. Now, you'll likely appreciate that with this heterogeneous uh, genetic background and high morphological variation, these are all medium ground finches from Daphne. Uh, we have a really powerful opportunity to revisit this question of, of what genes are involved in the beak morphology variation. And one of the first things we can do is, ask, is look at how much heritability is explained by all the SNPs in our data set. And what we find in the total um, heritability uh, for beak size and beak shape and body weight find very, very high heritability estimates. So SNP heritability for beak size is about 0.96. For beak shape, it's more like 0.8. Uh, and these estimates actually match pedigree-based estimates that the grants did many years ago um, really pretty well. Now, what we see is that most of this heritability is accounted for by parts of the genome that have very high LD patterns. Uh, and this is, I think, consistent with what we found on um, these large haplotypes segregating among species. Um, this led us to suspect that's probably what we would also find here in our GWAS associations for these different morphological traits. So this is a, a genome-wide association analysis that we performed um, for body weight in the medium ground finch. And on the y-axis uh, is this minus log 10 p-value, so strength of association with the trait that we're studying across the, the x-axis are uh, all of the SNPs in our data set. And what you can see is that there's just a couple of places in the genome that are strongly associated with body weight. Um, and one of them is this locus here on chromosome 1A. This is this locus that overlaps the gene HMGA2, which has been char previously characterized in association with different body sizes across different species. We already know through some genotyping that it facilitated survival during that 2004-2005 drought event. We also see a barely significant association with the gene IGF2 over here, which is one of these insulin growth factors, um, which commonly comes up, for example, in domestic breeding experiments um, in association with overall body size. So no major surprises here. But if we run a GWAS um, for beak dimensions, so overall beak size and beak shape, um, th that's what we're showing here in the bottom. We again, we pick up this locus number three that contains HMGA2 as well as five other signals. I mean, really, it's pretty easy to pick out these five very strong associations um, that are associated with uh, the beak morphology differences that we're testing here. And so this is including body size as a covariate. Um, but one of these low signs that we pick out is this gene ALX1. We looked at its in C2 expression earlier in the data set, and we know this is likely involved in the overall shape of the beak. Now, these loci explain a great deal of variation in beak morphology. I'm showing effect size estimates here on the x-axis. And you can see that we've got this locus number three explain almost 25% of variation in overall beak size. The other loci explain somewhere between uh, uh, you know, maybe 5% and 10% of variation in overall beak size. And I've, I've put a little bit of a, of a metric for scale here, what the, um, the average uh, effect size is for individual loci associated with human height, which is a very small percent. percent. It tends to be like less than 0.1% for any individual associated with human height differences. So that's just to emphasize that these, these six loci we identified with this GWAS scan seem to have a very uh, 
they explain a lot of variation in peak morphology and more than we would maybe expect from other, uh, especially human GWAS studies that tend to find a very highly polygenic background. I'm also showing the effect size for overall beak shape, right? So this is like how pointed is the beak? And we, ex we explain comparatively less of this variation, but we do recover this one locus, which seems to have uh, its principal effect seems to be on the overall um, shape of the beak compared to the other ones. But I'll, uh, we tend to do a better job of predicting the all overall variation in beak size and beak shape, which is where most of the variation is. Now, uh, this locus that we talked that we identified on chromosome 1A that's associated with body weight and beak size, this seems to be, uh, uh, this is associated with both dimensions. And this is because there's an allometric effect, uh, allometric scaling between body size and beak size, right? So the larger you are, you also tend to have a larger beak. So we see that this locus uh, alone explains about 23% of variation in beak size, about 12% of the variation in body weight. But if we look at the residuals of a model comparing weight and beak size, then we find that there's an independent effect of this locus on overall beak size independent of body weight. And what we think is happening here is that this haplotype has effects on both of these different traits with an independent effect on beak size as well. And I think it suggests this locus is particularly large. This is that uh, it's about a 500 KB interval. I think it's possible that there are multiple adaptive alleles <laughs> that are involved in these dual phenotypes uh, that have this very close relationship. We're also able to identify a handful of novel signals that are associated with beak morphology that we hadn't found before. Uh, one of these is, is one of these insulin growth factor binding proteins here uh, on chromosome 2, as well as um, another insulin growth factor on chromosome 1A. And this repeated discovery of insulin growth factors uh, is perhaps not overly surprising. These are commonly discovered in association with overall size, uh, in, especially in domestic animals. And it might be a network that actually co-evolves uh, in a way that's um, uh, a variable enough to be, uh, to be appearing in these types of uh, associations. Now, these loci, despite the fact that they are on different chromosomes, uh, they, have, they all have additive effects in a typical variation, and, it and they also interact with each other um, additively. So if you have a large allele at one locus and a large allele at the other locus, you also have the largest phenotype. Um, so they, they have this interaction amongst different loci in association uh, uh, that's, that's a clearly additive effect. Now, when we look at different genetic backgrounds in the other species that we have on the island, so in cactus finches and large ground finches, which we have pretty good sample size to do this for, in the cactus finches, uh, we find five of these signals as also strongly associated with peak morphology, as well as another uh, uh, potentially interesting signal on chromosome five, which I probably won't get into today. Uh, but in large ground finch, we only really find one significant locus. And one of the reasons for this variation in identifying GWAS hits is that uh, these populations are. Uh, differ in their allele frequency. So the large ground finch is fixed for the large allele at uh, locus number three and locus number seven, and the cactus finch is nearly fixed for the locus at um, locus number one. So there's a relationship between uh, discovering these GWAS signals and allele frequency, and some populations are fixed for different alleles. Ah, look at that. I had a handy slide pointing out, which I pointed out with my fingers. So uh, we can use this knowledge we have of various loci in the genome that are associated uh, that we think are associated with morphological variation, and ask whether or not the uh, their changes in allele frequency are associated with the changing phenotypes we see over this trajectory. So what I'm showing here in the bottom plot is the allele frequency trajectory for each of the six loci that we identified, and what you can see is that most of them have had pretty dramatic shifts over the time period here. So they range anywhere from about seven percent as much as thirty percent changes in allele frequency. What this means is that at many of these loci, the, rail, the rare allele has become the more common allele at the end of the study period. And if we look at uh, average change compared to the previous year, so allele, allele frequency change um, from one year to the next, and we average it across all the loci and compare it to a lot of random variants across the genome, we see much more dramatic shifts in allele frequency at these loci that we identified than random loci throughout the genome. And of course, um, what the eye easily picks out uh, is this interval in the 2004-2005 period, which overlaps with this drought event that we just talked about earlier on in this presentation. And if we look at each of these individual, uh, uh, each of these loci, uh, we find that uh, shown here on the x-axis is um, small heterozygous and large haplotype. And the proportion of individuals that survived that drought event in 2004-2005, we see that most, uh, most of these loci show this uh, increased survival of the small haplotype compared to the large haplotype, 
we've identified selection coefficients of about 0.5, even as high as um, 0.55 associated with surviving uh, uh, this drought event if you have a small haplotype. And what we also found is that three loci with these most dramatic patterns together better explain the probability of survival during the drought than any one single locus alone, suggesting that uh, multiple of these loci have been associated with survival during this drought event. Now, if we look at the cactus finch population, these have shown a comparatively modest change in their phenotype over time. The most dramatic shift in phenotype in the cactus finches has been for, uh, 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 the beaks have become progressively more blunt. And we also see more modest changes in allele frequency in the cactus finch. The most dramatic shift here is the flight green locus, which is ALX1, that also has the largest effect on overall beak shape. So that makes a little bit of sense. But overall, these dynamics are a little bit more uh, stable over time. And we think that the likely contribution to phenotypic variation in the cactus finches is primarily intergression. And so we see evidence that you're more likely to have a blunt allele at these loci if you have increased an uh, ancestry from the medium ground finches. And I think that would lead to these uh, slightly more stable trajectories over time, both in phenotype and allele frequency fluctuation. If intergression takes a little bit more time to generate these processes than these single strong selection events that we see in the medium ground finches. So bearing all this in mind, um, I'll take a moment at the end here to wrap up the question of uh, something that's somewhat surprising in this study. If you were to read the human GWAS literature, um, you'd find you know, repeated references to uh, traits being highly polygenic, many, many loci across the genome that each, each explain a very small amount of the uh, variation in that trait. In the uh, ground finches, we find the six loci explain as much as 46% of the variation in overall beak size. So this is a pretty striking contrast. It begs the question of why is this a pattern that we find in the loci here, but maybe not in human studies. And I think that there are a few different properties of the system that uh, make some intuitive sense why this might be something we uh, find here. One of them is the standing genetic variation. So we talked about some of these haplotypes being quite old. They've likely been subject to purifying selection for a very long time. We know that they can be successful on different um, genomic ancestry backgrounds. And I think this is the kind of scenario that you might expect for a large effect loci to persist. We also see this oscillating environmental conditions. So I'm showing this nice figure from an earlier study by the grants that shows how selection coefficients and beak size have changed over time. So sometimes you see a positive selection coefficient for beak size, and other times you see a negative selection, uh, selection coefficient. And this is the kind of scenario where just because you have strong selection, you, might, you would predict that, that would lead to fixation of large effect alleles. But if you have these oscillating directions that might maintain these uh, uh, loci uh, segregating at vari uh, variable levels throughout this time period. And so I think that is also one of the contrib uh, contributors in unstable environments where you might type see these types of large effect alleles appearing and being discoverable with the kind of approaches we took here. So to summarize this, um, project in the whole, we have some really wonderful evidence from phenotypic and pedigree analysis that suggests that natural selection is happening in real time and shaping the trajectory, trajectory of these populations. And we show that uh, six loci explain a great deal of this variation um, that has shifted populations. And we also show that there's a strong contribution of standing variation as well as integration. And I think it's intuitive to look at these trajectories that uh, uh, that we've shared here and think about um, what's going to happen to these populations in the future. You know, it's easy to draw a line through these plots and say, oh, are we just going to merge into one, you know, uh, meta population of finches on Daphne, or are we going to see some intrinsic properties start to pull them apart? And so just for a couple of minutes, I'll talk about um, what I think the future of research on Daphne looks like. And uh, I, while thinking about this question and ideas for this, um, many of you in this room who know me, uh, you might know me through my work in the California Conservation Genomics Project, uh, which is alluded to earlier on this. Uh, so I'm the bioinformatics guy generating uh, uh, PCF files for this project. And this project is really quite cool. It's, uh, uh, it's this giant state-funded project generating thousands of genomes uh, for wild population in California. Uh, and asking this question, how can we use genomics to inform conservation and understand how populations are going to change through time? And uh, uh, some of my work on this and with my colleagues here at Berkeley, who are generating some cool ideas from comparative analysis here, are coming up with creative ways to compare amongst different species uh, where we see patterns in the landscape uh, that shape population patterns, such as this uh, common trends of gene flow across California, where you can see, for example, in the Bay Area, very low migration rates compared to the rest of California that we see consistently across different species. And so I've been thinking about these kind of questions while working on this 
um, very cool project when I had the exciting opportunity earlier this year to go down to Daphne Major and survey the populations uh, uh, earlier in January. And I visited Daphne with my colleagues, uh, Galapagos colleagues, Carlos Valle, uh, who's a professor at U uh, University of San Francisco de Quito. And we wanted to resample this population which hadn't been visited for 10 years. And you know what's happened to the populations there? Uh, we were looking for this hybrid species that have been described from the island and generally trying to uh, track these populations uh, further in time. Now, what we found, is that overall the size of the beaks in the medium ground finches have continued to be uh, continue to get smaller. The cactus finch populations have continued to become increasingly blunt. So these these trajectories have tended to continue to play out. But what we see in the cactus finches in particular is really a remarkable amount of variation. It seems like more variation in the overall shape of the beak and the cactus finches, uh, as well as many more cactus finches than there were even ten years ago. So these populations are in, on Daphne, they're not static. They have continued to change over time. And I think they have a lot more to teach us about, um, well, a lot of different things. But one of them is, is, is what, uh, not only what is the future of population of Daphne, but what can they teach us about climate change? They've been an amazing model for many years for understanding evolutionary biology, but one of the, some, some of the things that they could teach us about our changing climate. Now, the temperature of the water in the Galapagos has already started to heat up. And this is going to lead to a couple of different types of predictions um, for what the environment will look like in the Galapagos. One of them is that uh, we may predict to see increased rainfall in the Galapagos over time. And this might lead to, on Daphne, an increased availability in seeds, uh, as well as a potential decrease in the cactuses on the island. And so it's easy to wonder whether or not this variation in cactus finches um, might do better or worse under this changing scenario. But we also predict under climate change that we're going to see increase in extreme events. Uh, where we might see more increased and prolonged droughts that would affect these populations like we've seen before that, are, uh, that lead to these extreme selection events. Now, if these extreme selection events happen more often, then we can wonder whether or not these alleles might um, eventually come to fixation and we don't see this variation being maintained. We also might expect to see changes in the hybridization dynamics because we tend to see hybridization occurring after these population crashes. So it's easy to return to some of these classic examples uh, of evolutionary change in um, in the literature, such as adaptive landscapes, where on Daphne, we'd expect two populations, medium ground finches and cactus finches, to be doing quite well. But if we see a resource-induced shift, then whether or not these two species are able to coexist or if they're going to merge together like we predicted from these ancestry epic trends. And I think this is really exciting because um, with this data set, we have powerful opportunity to look at how hybridization affects the ability for populations to, uh, to go through these changes, as well as uh, uh, we have this simple genetic uh, architecture that may or may not facilitate these adaptations. And lastly, I'll end with this somewhat enduring question that uh, has been asked about Daphne for a very long time, which is, um, is this something that we can use to infer processes happening around the globe? And um, is it, or is it really just this isolated tiny little island uh, in the Galapagos? And I would argue that, um, you know, it's a useful model, right? And it's one that it encompasses, uh, has conditions that are happening in places all around the globe. There are plenty of places with increased rainfall, but we have California with increased frequency of droughts. You know, these general environmental changes are things that are happening all over. We also, as many of you in this room um, probably really intimately appreciate, can be very difficult to do uh, map genotype to phenotype. And we have this very uh, powerful system where we actually know a lot of the variation, uh, genotype variation that explains phenotypic variation. And so we have a really powerful opportunity to link genotype to changing environmental conditions. And I think the other thing is that uh, despite the fact that it's this tiny rock in the ocean, there are other environments throughout the world, such as high elevation grasslands. There are also these isolated pockets um, of islands, as well as other islands in the world, um, where similar things are playing out. So I think there's a lot of potential to use Daphne going into the future as a model for understanding how populations are adapting to this changing climate. And that's, uh, I'll end it here. Uh, happy to take any questions. This work, of course, uh, couldn't be done without the amazing long-term work of Peter and Rosemary Grant of Daphne, uh, my postdoc advisor, Leif, who's really pioneered a lot of the genomic work in the Finches, as well as a lot of the co-authors. Uh, yeah, so thank you, and thanks for listening, guys. Somebody did get the lights there, and I'm sure Eric would be happy to take any questions. Yeah, please. Uh, are there enough museum specimens that go back in history so that you can ask the question whether or not the patterns that you've seen over the last 30 years 
have been repeated in the past? That's an excellent question. Um, I'd love to know the answer to that. On, on Daphne, the answer is no, there aren't yeah. a, a lot of specimen records, but it, it could be in some of these earlier collections um, that have been made in the Finches. Uh, and I think it would be very interesting that the challenge there is uh, outside of Daphne, we don't know too much about the frequency, say, of these variants specifically. But I think it would be very much possible to go and generate that data now, particularly given what we know. So yeah, I think there's opportunity that if we can get access and get uh, uh, permission to get genetic data from those specimens, it would be very cool. Yeah. Uh, there's some specimens in this museum, I think, of Darwin's, yeah, which is, uh, yeah, OK, I, <laughs> I, I told you. Yeah. Yeah. And those are here. Okay, very good. But the grand students uh, get any samples uh, from those El Nino years in the seventies? Was that? I, I wondered this question myself, where those would be, and I'm not sure if they're at Princeton because they definitely uh, they at least measured them. I don't know if they collected them. It's a, it's a good question. I mean, it would be great to uh, to to be able to like, get samples yeah. from those years and and, and see. It. Yeah. So they weren't doing any talking out there. They were just taking measurements from live animals. Yes. That were marking places. Yep. But there, uh, during this, uh, these strong selection events, they were finding dead birds yeah. um, and able yeah. to measure them and find that it was the large birds that were dead. Um, yeah, that would be, yeah, you're right. But, <laughs> but I'm actually not, that's a good question that I, I've wondered the answer to. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, this is really fantastic. Thank you. Yeah, it's stirred up a lot of questions in my mind about the role of um, early on in adaptation that we might expect different alleles to physical adaptation than ticks later. And so, but what you're finding is, are these ancient alleles that uh, are still important. And so, uh, how do you think your work challenges these kind of ideas, especially with respect to both the, um, the geometric model, which I think is pretty consistent with, yeah. and then these kind of newer ideas from, you know, I don't know if you're familiar with Guy Sellers' work from the sort of turnover. It's it's a good question. I I wouldn't say that I would like to challenge any great paradigms. <laughs> uh, if anything, um, I suspect that if you were to take some of these populations, like the large ground finch, and mm -hmm. get really huge samples and try to characterize variation and, and say their morphology, which is less, uh, and they tend to be fixed for these alleles, um, then you may find an architecture more akin to like a geometric model, right? And I think that would actually be a cool thing to do, uh, despite that this is very interesting. And uh, it would be nice to kind of go and characterize that variation, so to speak. And I, I think one possibility that might merge these two ideas is that the idea that if you were to have uh, one of these large effect low psycho to fixation, say, in the large ground finch, you might start to see a lot of other alleles that um, uh, sort of balance its effect to some extent that pop up and these end up sort of being your polygenic loci that you would picked up later after this single locus has gone to fixation. Um, that's kind of how I envision that link um, as one possible way to explain what we see in the medium ground finch versus other populations maybe that have gone to sort of fixation, so to speak. But that stands to be potentially determined. Yeah, does that answer your question? Yeah. It, it's a very, very abstract yeah. question. Yeah, well, uh, I didn't even thought about it. Thought, thought about it, but it would be nice to be able to quantify it better. And here we it's focused especially on these medium ground finches that really have this property. And I mean I do think it's an like intrinsically fascinating that this hyper variable kinetic species that exists between these two optimas, um, you know, that, that kind of seems to move between them in some ways is also what we see genetically. And there's some tie in there that is uh escaped me in characterizing fully, but I think it's a very uh, very interesting. Um, Property of the medium crowds, which is, yeah. Yeah. Question in the back. Can you talk a bit more about the nature of the new site and uh, to what we are specifically, especially thinking about that string of work from about 10 years ago from uh, Archer and Lion Wong, basically, what our model was being before and seems to be enough to improve the yeah, number yeah. of um, shapes. Yeah, for sure. Uh, so I didn't get too much into what are in these haplotypes specifically. Now, at most of these loci, we don't see, say, an enrichment of uh, missense mutations. So we don't see a lot of protein coding variants in there in general. I think in general, these are probably mostly regulatory changes. And uh, there are some uh, examples not of that. So ALX1 has two missense mutations that are associated with these different haplotypes. 
Um, but in general, because these haplotypes are quite large, the very narrow genetic architecture and how the uh, and what genes are involved is, is quite difficult to, to get at. Um, but we've been kind of probing at looking at uh, things like conservation scores uh, across, uh, across these haplotypes to see if we can get closer to where uh, there's actually functional changes happening. Um, so to some extent, you know, we haven't been able to go too far beyond because we do have these large haplotype blocks. The question about um, our hats work with uh, calmodulin and DMP4, I think that's a little bit of an interesting open question. So these two uh, genes were found to be strongly uh, associated with differences in build morphology by looking at gene expression and developing embryos. Uh, and we haven't recaptured these in any of our GWAS scans in general in the finches, um, which I think is uh, interesting, but likely indicates that they're part of some gene network associated with other elements that are uh, segregating in the finches. But it's a very interesting question uh, that would be cool to find out the answer to, which I think eventually probably we will, I hope. Does that answer your question? Yeah, go ahead. Are you planning or is someone trying to stick the genes that you found in a chicken in your gut and see what happens? Uh, good question. Um, the answer to that is is potentially yes, <laughs> uh, but as far as I know, that hasn't been successful. Uh, this locus number three with HMGA2, um, that has been an idea around for a while to see if it affects chicken beak morphology, but as far as I know, that hasn't been successful. Uh, that's not work that I've been involved in. It's a challenge on that locus because there are, it's big enough that I think there are several genes that are very strong candidates for this variation, but HMGA2, which is associated with cranial facial development, is definitely one of the strongest uh, candidates. Yeah, it's a good question. Yeah. When you talk about uh, variations in diet, but is it possible that uh, the differences in diet are responsible in part or core vary with the beak size and a bigger seed might be harder to digest than a smaller seed versus uh, fruits, which have a whole other uh, biochemistry. That's a yeah, that's a good question. I, so, and and we'll see whether or not I answer your question correctly. But of course, uh, the cactus finches these are fascinating. These are uh, eating not only the um, the pollen but also the the stamens off these cactus pods. It's amazing to walk around Daphne and all these cacti are missing their stamens because the cactus finches have come and plucked them off. So they have this amazingly specialized diet, which is pretty rare in birds to be eating flower petals in general. Um, and so one answer to the question is, yes, there must be some physiological uh, changes that allows them to uh, digest these flowers. Um, and whether or not that relates to the, I think what you're getting at is that whether or not these loci may not necessarily be associated with morphology, but also the physiological processing of these different diets, which is a very cool question. I don't have a clear answer to that. One thing I'll say about cactus finches is that in a study I unfortunately didn't have time to talk about today, um, the cactuses, the cactus finches have a really high frequency of this polymorphism where their beak as a uh, as a nestling is bright yellow, and other populations also have this. The cactus finches in particular have this. And we found that it, uh, it's caused by a mutation in a gene called BCO2, um, which active BCO2 breaks down carotenoids. And in the cactus finches, uh, they have this mutation that uh, uh, essentially means that carotenoids aren't being broken down. So they have a lot of carotenoids in their beaks. And we think that this might be related to um, uh, sort of the biochemical process of, of dealing with eating a lot of pollen um, potentially. And that's one reason why we think they might have a high frequency of this particular polymorphism. Um, anyway, it's a little bit tangential to what you're asking, but did I mostly? Yeah, that's, yeah. It's, it's a big yeah. question. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's a big question. I have a, a related question to that. Um, so vertebrates, particularly birds, um, can't really digest pollen. And so I'm, I'm wondering, particularly now with what's happening with the cactus finch, with the, you know, the big introduction of alleles in fish and wheat birds, is anybody doing microbiome studies related to, to birds with different sized beaks? Just seeing how, if there's variation in the diet, it's how that's sort of shaping microbiome and it's interact. With your genomes, you can look at interactions between the microbiome yeah. and the host. In a really cool way. Yeah, it would be very cool to do. The answer is no, that person might be me um, in the future <laughs> uh, if, if I can get to that point. Um, something that's very tractable, I think, um, on Daphne that would be cool to do is that there are these classical studies there looking at essentially the food resource partitioning based on different beak sizes. And the cactus finches are the ones that have most dramatically changed in beak morphology since those earlier studies were done. 
And anecdotally, when I was on the island, I felt that it, it seemed to me that the cactus finches were eating, going and eating seeds more than I expected because they spent a lot of time on the cacti. And I think it would be very interesting to kind of revisit some of these classical studies to see if their resource uh, time on these different resources changed. And of course, nowadays we could actually quantify this at a much finer scale with microbiome work, which I completely agree would be very cool to do. Yeah. So I don't have an answer to a question, but uh, yes, yeah, I agree. Back to your thought of, with a change in the system, it actually facilitates asking that question in a more powerful way. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I, and I think the first step would be determining if there has been a diet shift, uh, and then we might predict to see that. Yeah. It's good. Good. It's a great question. Well, wonderful. I, Darwin's finches keep on delivering. It's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, thank you very much for yeah. a great talk. Thank you so much. Water here. I'm Jim Pack. Oh, hi. Great pleasure. Uh, I, 